Uh, thank you for joining us again as we are continuing our study through the book of Galatians. Uh, this morning, uh, the passage serves as a warning to us. Uh, just as it was a warning to the church in Galatia, it's a warning to us, and it tells us, don't abandon the grace of God for anything. Don't abandon the grace of God for anything. We're going to see this in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. And so if you have your Bible, I would invite you to turn with me there and read along with me as I read aloud for us. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. This is what God's Word says. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Would you pray with me as we consider God's Word this morning? Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word, even when it warns us. Lord God, guard me from error. Bless Your people to the praise of Your name, the gl Your glory in our church, and our good. We love You and we thank You. It's in Jesus' holy name we ask and pray. Amen. Well, if you're following along in the listening guide, you're going to notice that there are two points to be made from this passage that we're looking at this morning. And here's the first point. And I am going to encourage you to make sure that you're paying close attention to your Bible. This is a deep study in the book of Galatians. We're going to be in the book of Galatians for several weeks. And so this is, we're going deep. I believe that you can handle it and that you will benefit from it immensely. So we're just looking at a few verses today. So look with me at your Bible as we consider this first point. Don't abandon the grace of God for another gospel. Don't abandon the grace of God for another gospel. You find this in verses 6 through 9. Now, as I was studying this passage this week, I have to admit, I was struck by this idea that Paul would warn the Christians in Galatia about deserting. Look at verse 6. Why have you so quickly deserted the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel? I mean, I thought to myself, why would anyone desert and, and, and try to run away from grace? You know, don't, don't we like grace? You know, as, 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 um, uh, in addition to being a pastor, I'm also a professor. And oftentimes whenever I'm grading papers, I'll get a, <laughs> I'll get a frantic email at the end of the semester um, from a student and they want to know what they can do to get their grade up. And oftentimes I have to let them know, hey, you know, I'm, I'm pretty gracious. So if you turn in your work and I, I, will, I will be gracious with my grading. It's something that I say often. And so I thought, who doesn't want grace? And then as I thought about it, you know, there's something about thinking on grace where for us to admit that we need it, means that we're in a pretty desperate situation. So my students, you know, they're, they, they want grace with their grading. The implication is, is they don't feel like they did very well on that uh, philosopher report that they're turning in or their final exam. They want to know that I'm going to give them something that they have not worked for, they have not deserved. Now, the reality is for us to recognize that we need grace means that we are admitting I'm in bad shape. I need help. I need, I need pretty desperate help, actually. Now, for some people, that's not a problem. For some of us, maybe, maybe you, you don't like the idea 
of not being self-sufficient, not being able to take care of yourself, and the fact that you need grace, it might even be a little offensive to you. And I think that part of what we're dealing with in the book of Galatians, and this is going to become a lot more clear as we're studying the book in the weeks to come, is what has happened is we have these false teachers that have crept into the church in Galatia, and they're telling these Christians, hey, look, Jesus alone, having faith in Jesus alone, it's not enough. You're going to have to do something else. You're going to have to be circumcised. You're going to have to obey the food laws. You're going to have to do all these other things. And people were like, you know, the nice thing about me doing something is if I do it, I get to kind of boast. It's, it's Jesus and me. But that's not biblical Christianity. The gospel of Jesus Christ tells us that the contribution, the contribution that we bring to salvation is our need. We bring an empty cup that needs to be filled up with grace. We don't bring anything but our sin that needs to be forgiven. We don't bring anything but our disease that needs to be healed. We don't bring anything to the table to bargain with. We, as the old hymn would say, um, I come to you with, with empty hands. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's one that humbles the pride of man and tells man, woman, boy, and girl, you cannot save yourself. You need someone to save you. And that's what God has done in Jesus Christ. He's come to save sinners. For some of you, that's the best news you could possibly hear today. And for others of you, you're offended to hear that I don't think you can save yourself. But that's the only salvation that is available for us, is a salvation that's not by our own works, but by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. The gospel of God's grace in Jesus Christ, it humbles us. It reminds us that apart from God's kindness, we cannot be saved and we have nothing at all to boast in. So I'm just going to go ahead and throw this out there. If you are a Christian today, you have nothing to boast in but the cross of Jesus Christ that saved you. That's the only thing that you can boast in. So, so, so let me say this. We have no grounds for pride as the people of God. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 could not be more clear for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is a gift of God, not by works. Why is it not by works? So that you and I, we cannot boast. There is no boasting at the foot of the cross where we bring our sins. It's just rejoicing that he would set his affection and love upon us, that he would let grace flow down and mercy flow down and and love flow down to sinners like me and then like you. The grace of God tells us we are weak. And so some people are offended and they run and they abandon the grace of God and they're looking for another gospel, another gospel that could save them by their own effort. They may even add Jesus to it. You see this in different types of false religions that are out there. Jehovah's Witnesses, this is the case. With Mormons, this is the case. Where where they believe that their, their acceptance before God is ultimately going to be based upon how they perform. You will never perform well enough to be accepted by God, save in the salvation that rests in Jesus Christ alone by faith. It's by faith that we are saved. We are justified by faith, not by works of the law, not by our performance, not by our religious activity. You are not saved because you read your Bible every day and because you pray and because you you watch these sermons as we put them out every week. You're not saved because uh, you tithe and you give an offering. You are not saved because of those things. You may do those things because you're saved, but those things do not save you. We are saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit gives us new life. Do not... Abandon the grace of God for some other made-up gospel. Those that would preach another gospel, 
those that preach a gospel that says Jesus is not enough, you have to do your some, you have to do something yourself. Paul says that the curse of God abides on them. And while I fully believe and trust that Paul wants those people to be saved because God wants those people to be saved as well, we see that test that testimony. God desires that none would perish, but all would come to eternal life. The reality is, is those that do not put their trust in Jesus, the curse of God remains over them presently. John 3 even talks about that, that, that the condemnation of the world is already on those that have not trusted in Christ. And the only hope for condemnation to be removed from us is for us to place our trust in the one who came as Paul would say, the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. So don't turn to other gospels. Do not be led aside by other religions and other cults that would tell you that in order to be saved, you have to perform. You have to pull it off. You can't. There are essentially two religions in the world. There's the religion that says you have to do, 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 do. You have to work. You have to work. You have to work. You have to work. And then there's the religion that says, done, done, done. It's been done for you. Come and rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel that Paul preached. That is the gospel that I preach. And that is the only gospel that can save. Do not abandon the grace of God for another gospel. There is no other gospel. There is no other name by which we can be saved, but the name of Jesus Christ. Do not abandon the grace of God for another gospel. There is no other gospel. Now, the second thing that we find in this passage, though, is found in verse 10. Look with me at verse 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? For if I were still trying to please people... I would not be a servant of Christ. So the second point here, do not abandon the grace of God for the approval of others. Do not abandon this gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ that tells us that God is holy, that tells us that we are sinners and that we have sinned against God. Do not abandon this gospel that says that He died in our place, that He lived a perfect life and He died a sinner's death, that we might be set free. Don't abandon that message. Don't abandon the message that says that in order to receive this gift, you have to believe. And part of the believing, the, the other side of the believing is turning away away from your own self-reliance. We call this repentance. So it's repenting of our own self-reliance, our own attempts to save ourselves and saying, I can't do it. I can't do anything. I, I, I turn away from all my self-effort. I repent and I believe, I trust in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. That message, as we've already said, seen, can be very offensive because it acknowledges that God is holy. It acknowledges that we are sinners. It acknowledges that the only way that we can be saved is through Jesus Christ. And it tells us that in order for us to be saved, we must place our trust in Jesus Christ. And that's, that's offensive. It's offensive in a pluralistic society that we live in. It's offensive in a society that is exceedingly uncomfortable, actually uh, hostile toward Christianity regarding things that we believe that the Bible teaches regarding sin. And so when we uh, come to this passage in Galatians chapter 1 verse 10, uh, we see this church in Galatia dealing with things that we may even ourselves be tempted with. They are going to be tempted to abandon this gospel of the grace of God and Jesus Christ because it doesn't please everybody to hear the message that they're going to be preaching. So what will we do? What, 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 what will you do? What will you do when we find ourselves tempted to soften what God teaches us about our own sin? And that God calls us to repent of sin and trust in Jesus Christ. Will, will we be ashamed? Will we be scared? Will we be full of fear? Will we do as some have done and 
And instead of preaching the, a message of God's holiness, man's sinfulness, Christ's sufficiency, and our need to repent and believe, instead of preaching that message, will we preach a health, wealth, prosperity gospel message, which is no gospel at all, which just tells people that all God wants out of us is for us to be healthy, wealthy, and wise in this life with material blessing? Will we, will we, who doesn't want to hear a message about that? That's why it's so popular. But are we trying to be popular? Are we trying to be approved by others? Or do we want to please God? We are going to be tempted at times because it's hard. You're going to have friends. You're going to have neighbors. You're going to have coworkers. You're going to have family members that are going to read the Bible and they're going to ask you questions. They're going to say, do you really believe what the Bible teaches about sexuality? Do you really believe what the Bible teaches about the, the sanctity of marriage? Do you really believe what the Bible says about uh, Jesus being the only way to salvation? Do you really believe those types of things? Do you really believe these hard teachings? And the temptation at times is going to be, well, you know... I you know, those are, what are you going to say? This passage warns us that we cannot abandon the grace of God that saves us simply because the message of the grace of God makes a lot of people uncomfortable. The message of God's grace, remember, it comes to us as a people who are in need. Why are we in need? Because in and of ourselves, we are incapable of saving ourselves. It is offensive to the natural man. So will we try to please the world? Or will we choose to please God? Paul lays it out. Do not abandon the grace of God for the approval of others. When we are tempted to compromise the gospel in order to win the approval of others, we must remember that salvation is only found, only found in the true gospel of Jesus Christ. We will never find salvation in being liked by others. We will never find salvation in approval from our peers. The final approval that we need and really the only one that we ought to be longing for is the approval of God the Father because by the work and the power of the Holy Spirit, He has made us to be born again to eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That is the only approval that we need. That does not mean that we live like jerks to the world. But it does mean that at the end of the day, if the world says, I cannot believe that you would believe that, you say, I believe it because it is the only gospel that saves. It is the only hope that we have in this world. And I am telling you hard truths because I want you to be saved too because there is no salvation in anyone else in any other name but in the name of of Jesus. So, brothers and sisters, the message of Galatians 1, 6-10 is that we must not abandon the grace of God for anything. We must not turn aside and turn away from the gospel of God's grace in Jesus. Instead, we must cling to to the grace of God in Jesus Christ that saves us from the judgment that we deserve for the rebellion that we have committed. God in His great mercy has sent Jesus Christ into the world to save sinners like you and like me. And we receive this salvation by the grace of God, which is a gift to us to be received by faith. It is not a wage that we earn through our work. The only wage that we have ever earned has been the wage of sin, which is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. What are some of the things that this means for us in terms of an application? There are three points of application that I would like to make before we close. I'll make these quickly. The first is this. I would encourage you. I would commend you. I would compel you. I would beg you 
be enthralled with the gospel of God's grace. Do not be like the Galatians and so easily desert the one who called you. What a strong way of stating that. They were literally turning away from God himself when they turned away from the grace of God. It doesn't say you turned away from the grace of God. It says you turned away from the one who was calling you, the one who had mercy upon you, the one who sought you and pursued you. Be enthralled. Be overwhelmed. Be in love. Meditate upon this message of of God's holiness, our sinfulness, Christ's sufficiency in grace and His work on our behalf, and the fact that by His mercy we have repented and we've believed that we might be saved. Be enthralled with the gospel of God's grace. There is no other gospel but the gospel of God's grace. The second thing that I would have you see is that we need to be vigilant with the gospel of God's grace. Be vigilant with the gospel of God's grace. What that means is is not only should you be enthralled with the gospel, but you should know the gospel and you should be able to discern truth from error. And that was one of the big problems going on here in the book of Galatia. They were not discerning the true gospel from a false gospel. Could you, can you, discern the difference between the true gospel of God's grace and a false gospel? And here's the reality. There are hundreds, dare I say thousands of people that call themselves Christians or they call themselves preachers. And even they have books that are written and published with Christian publishers. And they peddle a message that's not the true gospel of Jesus Christ. But they call themselves Christians. They say they believe in grace. They say they believe in the gospel. Could you, can you discern? Are you being vigilant to say, you know, what that person is saying does not add up with what I find in my Bible. We we do not need to be gullible. We need to discern truth from error. It's the gospel that's at stake. Be vigilant with the gospel of God's grace. And then finally, be faithful with the gospel of God's grace. Be faithful to the one we belong to. Who do we belong to? We belong to Christ. I just, I just love the way that Paul talks about his relationship to Christ in Ephesians, I mean not Ephesians, I'm sorry, in Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. He says... If I'm still trying to please Christ, then I would not be a servant of Christ. And what you and I, what we want to do when we hear that, we want to translate that idea of service as some sort of voluntary, I will show up and serve Christ when, whenever I kind of want to. That's not the type of service. Some of your translations say that I'm a bond servant. Other translations say I am a slave of Christ. Paul is saying, Christ is my master, and I'm going to be faithful to the one who owns me. I belong to him. I'm going to be faithful to my master. Why can I be faithful to him? Because he has been so faithful, and he has been so, so good to me. Do you belong to Jesus? Is he your master? That's what Romans 10 tells us, that in order to be saved, we have to confess that Jesus was raised from the dead and that we also have to believe that He is Lord. He is King over all. He's been given the name above every name. and He is exalted in heaven, soon to be returning to establish His reign here. And I wonder... Do you view Jesus as your master? Maybe you don't. And maybe what you need to have happen today is for you to have your first encounter with the grace of God. The grace of God calls you, beckons you to come 
bring all of your sin, all of your pain, all of your struggle and sorrow, all your brokenness, your addiction, all that sense of failure and slavery, enslavement. Bring it to Jesus, to the foot of the cross. He is faithful and He is just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. How? How do I do that? How do I call upon the name of the Lord in a saving way? Simple. You can bow your head even now as I kind of lead you through this. This is how you can do so. You call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. How do you do that? You say, Lord, I recognize that you are holy and that I have sinned against you and I have rebelled against you, but that you did not leave me in my sin. You sent Jesus Christ into the world to die in my place. He lived the perfect life that I could not live in conformity and obedience to your law. And he died the death that I deserve for being a lawbreaker that I might be treated like one, like one of your children. And he was raised from the dead so that I know that one day I too will be raised from the dead with a new body, with a new eternal life that I can enjoy even now knowing that Death will never separate me from you. Lord God, have mercy upon me. I am a sinner. I believe that Jesus died for me. Save me. If that's your prayer today, at the bottom of the screen, what you're going to see is you're going to see a a, a phone number that you can text the word pray to. Uh, If you would text the word pray to that number, we would love to get in touch with you today in order to pray with you about following Jesus in a more substantial way and what that looks like and what that means. We want to be able to pray with you. Maybe you're just struggling today and you need someone to pray with you. We would love, we would be happy to pray with you. You can also text the word pray to that number as well and someone will call and pray with you. But we want you to have dealings with this God, this God of grace who loves you and gave himself in your place so that you too might know the grace of God. You might know this great gospel of life and hope that that God in His great mercy has revealed to us. I love you all so much. Uh, I cannot wait to see you, um, those of you that are able to to be there uh, in a few weeks. Uh, We're going to continue to live stream, obviously, as I mentioned earlier. But I I just can't wait. um, And I'm looking forward to being with you um, very soon. I'm going to turn to the book of Jude that we might hear God's benediction over us. If you have your Bible, you can turn there uh, as as well. It's one of my favorite benedictions in all of Scripture. Jude only has one chapter, Jude 24 and 25. This is the great news of this great God who watches over us. Would you bow your head as I read God's benediction and blessing over us? To Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before His glorious presence without fault, with great joy. That's His blessing over us. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Lord God, keep us from stumbling. Present us blameless before your glorious presence with great joy. We love you. Bless this time in Jesus' matchless, holy name. Amen. Be blessed. Love you. See you very soon. Have a great day.